During the transition, we all went down a little rock and we were sitting around in the, in the uh, living room of, of the governor's mansion when he was, you know, he's president-elect and governor. And he, he looked at us all and he said, you know, I'm now going to be the leader of the free world. And he laughed. And then he said, but if you all don't tell me what you really believe, if you don't tell me what you really think, and you try to tell me what you think I want to hear, I'm going to be dead. Well, I think when you do it, Hank, you, you're hoping to catch a fish, a, a tarpon or a bonefish. When I do it, I actually catch bonefish and tarpon. <laughs> I, I, have managed, I have managed to translate hoping into actuality. But, I, I love it. Here's the small fish. Mine are the big ones. But anyway, go on. <laughs> well, I, don't know, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I'd like to hear some people validate that. Welcome to Straight Talk, a podcast about big ideas featuring candid discussions with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute, and today I'm speaking with Bob Rubin. Bob served as the United States Treasury Secretary from 1995 to 1999 under President Bill Clinton. He began his distinguished career in finance at Goldman Sachs and ultimately served as co-chairman. Bob joined the Clinton administration in 1993 as the first director of the White House National Economic Council. He is one of the founders of the Hamilton Project, an economic policy project housed at the Brookings Institution. He is the author of In an Uncertain World, Tough Choices from Wall Street to Washington, which was a New York Times bestseller, as well as being named one of Business Week's top 10 business books of the year. Bob, welcome to the podcast. I'm an unabashed admirer, so I'm looking forward to today's discussion. Now, let's start at the beginning. Talk about your upbringing. How did you get interested in finance and economics? What attracted you to public service? Well, I think it goes back a long way, Hank. I grew up in Miami Beach, Florida. Well, I was born in New York, but I grew up in Miami Beach. But my pre-college education wasn't very effective. That's not the school's fault. It was my fault. So I got to college and it really was a jarring experience for me. Half the kids in my class had gone to prep school or private school or whatever. And I came up woefully underprepared, but the result was that it really was jarring. And so it caused me to have to think through an awful lot of things that they would have just taken for granted because they'd already been through such an experience. And the result was that I, I developed a mindset in college that stood me in good stead, I think, for the rest of my life, which was to, to think that all issues are complex, all issues are uncertain, all issues are about probabilities, not, not absolutes. And I developed that mindset in those first couple of years in college, particularly as a consequence of a course in philosophy, philosophy one it was called. And that, that mindset and a sort of kind of constructive skepticism, if you want to call it that, and a tendency to question now, probably my psyche and my temperament as well, but I really developed an intellectual mindset or, or a frame of reference, a framework that I approached everything I did in the rest of my life. Fascinating because I sure saw it at Goldman Sachs. I really remember having you as a boss and how we're the boss. We worked together, but nobody was ever Hank Paulson's boss. But I was too well, 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 I, I, I sure remember coming into management committee meetings and being able to think, boy, this is intuitively obvious and making a point. And you would push back and relentlessly pound it into us the importance of this, you know, skepticism you had. I looked at it as the importance of rigorous analysis, not jumping to quick decisions and guarding against, protecting against low probability, large risk events. So expand on that. I think that's very important. And, and I think that underpins your approach to decision-making. Yeah, I think if, if you take a probabilistic view of things, Hank, you'll develop a base case, whatever it may be, but you'll also recognize there are low probability, usually consequential events that occur. And you have to figure out how to deal with that. And the problem we had that you have in that, Hank, is that if you don't do anything about it, if you just say, well, they're low probability, I'm not going to worry about it. If something bad happens, it can wipe you out. On the other hand, if you really try to fully protect yourself, you go out of business. This is something you do. We never told anybody, but Steve and I had, Steve Freeman and, you know, and I were both the co-COOs. We had our CFO do a study of the tail risks, that is to say the low probability, huge consequence events that could occur at Goldman Sachs. And if the very low probability but massive consequences that occurred, it would have wiped the firm out. And we decided not to discuss that with the partnership because there was no way to deal with that. On the other hand, 
what you can do and what I've done all my life with my personal financial situation, but I've also tried to do in a policy context and, and otherwise, is to recognize that these things can happen and you can't just ignore them. And so try to limit your exposure in some ways so that you can survive, maybe not horrendous times, but terrible times. And Bob, you know, your analytical approach to decision making, you know, went well beyond that. So even when we weren't dealing with, you know, severe risks and probabilities, just looking at, at everyday decisions, what was fascinating, because someone could come in and say, it's sort of obvious we should do this. And you might ultimately conclude it was obvious to do it, but you were able to see the other side. And you turn it around and say, what are all the reasons why it might not be obvious? What have you overlooked? I mean, nothing's ever been obvious. A partner of ours whose name I will not mention, but who you knew extremely well, and so did I, came to Steve Freeman and I once at the time that we were the co-COOs and said, there's a 100% chance this will work. It cannot lose. We should take a giant position. And I turned to him and I said, you know something? I think there's a really high probability this can work, but it's always possible that it can't work. And what do you think the odds of that are? And if that does happen, what happens? We agree with you. We're going to take a large position. But we're not going to take a limitless position. We're going to take a position that we can live with if it goes wrong. And but it's true. I think every every decision we made, we tried to do in a very probabilistic kind of way. And you know who was built that way? President Clinton was. When Larry Summers and I went to President Clinton about Mexico, there was a terrible problem in Mexico, and it could have it could have undermined the country with terrible effects for us. And we had a, a financial rescue program that we wanted to do, and we did do. And we said, Mr. President, this may not work. It's a question of probabilities. We believe it's the right thing to do. And he totally related to that approach, even though he knew that if it didn't work, he would pay a terrible price politically. Yeah, so that gets to your career in Washington. You know, serving as the very first head of the National Economic Council in Bill Clinton's White House and then as Treasury Secretary. So I want to start at the beginning. Where did you get interested in public service? What attracted you to come? And then I want you to explain to the listeners what the National Economic Council is, why it was created, and what you, you know, how you tried to model it as its first director. You know, who knows where, in a sense, Hank, for any of us, where our interests or our engagements come from. But my grandfather, my mother's father, was a very successful lawyer and real estate investor in Brooklyn. But his passion was politics. And he ran the most powerful political club in Brooklyn. He wasn't head of it because that was an elected official, but he ran it. And I remember when I was a little kid, my mother had an enormous regard for her father. And I would hear about this. And in those days, the club he ran, the Madison Club, was the most powerful club in, 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 in New York. And the, and the political clubs were really powerful. So I was exposed to this at an early age. Whether that's what got me oriented that way or not, I don't know. But I very early on, when I, got, when I went to Goldman Sachs, Hank, I knew two things. I knew, number one, I wanted to do well financially. I have a commercial bent. And number two, I really wanted to get involved in some way or other in the world beyond Goldman Sachs. And I was lucky because I was able to do it. And, and in that context, I wanted to get involved with public policy and politics. And eventually, I found ways to do that. And so now talk about the NEC. What is it? And you set the model. What were you trying to model? Well, during the transition, well, during the campaign, during the 92 campaign, President Clinton got the notion that the National Security Council coordinated national security policy, foreign policy, but that the different agencies, Treasury, Commerce, Trade, et cetera, Labor, all contributed to or all were involved with economic policy, but nobody was drawing them together. And then he looked at Brent Scowcroft, and Brent Scowcroft was President Bush's national security advisor. And he said, Brent Scowcroft is an honest broker. He brings everybody to the table. He lets them all put their views on the table. He can put his own views on the table too. Everybody's views get on the table. And that way the president can make the best informed decision possible. I wanna do that in the economic sphere. And they asked me to be the first head of the National Economic Council. And my fundamental view of it was that I needed to treat every member of the cabinet as if they were clients. Remember the way you treated your clients at Goldman Sachs, Hank? That's what I needed to do with all of them. So they would trust me. And I could have my own views, but as long as I express my own views also said, Mr. X has this view, and Mr. Y has that view, and Mrs. Z has that view, it would work, and it did work. Yeah, but I remember thinking about it, because I'd been in government as a kid, and then knowing what you were going to do, and I had some good laughs thinking about what it must have been like for some of those members, because even though you build trust, if they said things that they couldn't substantiate, 
or they made up things, or that they said there was no risk, or it was obvious you should go in one direction. I can just imagine what that conversation was oh, like. We, we didn't like that, Hank. We didn't like that at all. If people had, and there was one cabinet member particularly who had very strong views without very much basis for them. And uh, we helped the president understand that there was no basis for those views by asking questions that he couldn't answer. But let me tell you, President Clinton had that about him too. He also would press people to, to show what it, why it is they had the views they had. So working with him, you've talked about it a little bit. Give our listeners you know, a little bit more what it was like working with President Clinton. Let me tell you two things he said to us, which I think capture the man. During the transition, we all went down to Little Rock and we were sitting around in the, in the uh, living room of, of the governor's mansion when he was, you know, he's president-elect and governor. And he, he looked at us all and he said, you know, I'm now gonna be the leader of the free world. And he laughed. And then he said, but if you all don't tell me what you really believe, if you don't tell me what you really think, and you try to tell me what you think I wanna hear, I'm gonna be dead. I want you always to be honest with me about what you think, even if it's exactly the opposite of me. And you know something, Hank, we did that for eight years. We really and truly did. People who came into the administration late, say in the second term or, or the end of the first term, weren't used to that. But that was the spirit of, of that White House. The second thing he said to us that I've never forgotten is he said, I'm willing to fight with people all day long about policy, but I never want anybody to question the integrity of my numbers. And therefore he used the CBO. If President Clinton said something and somebody disagreed, he wanted to hear what it was. If nobody disagreed, you know what he would do? He would reach out and he would point to somebody or other and he'd say, what are the arguments against what I think? And it was, he's a terrific decision maker. And then he was, you know, he made, and, and he was very probabilistic in his way of thinking about it. And when, you know, Larry and I, I told you before, Larry and I about Mexico said, we think the probabilities are that it'll work, but it may not work. He reckoned, he related to all that. And he was willing to make decisions. It wasn't that he wasn't decisive. He was plenty decisive. But before he made a decision, he wanted to be well informed. I'm going to get to Mexico with, with the next question, but I'm just going to build on what you said, because, you know, having worked with and for terrific leaders, I've come to the conclusion that you can have different strengths and different weaknesses, and they can be very successful, but they can't be successful unless they surround themselves with good people who are going to speak truth to power and going to help compensate for some of their weaknesses and play to their strengths, but, you know, people that have a good sense of self-awareness. And it sure sounds like, you know, that that's what Bill Clinton was. And I know that's what you were and are. I think you got exactly right. Exactly right. I think part of that is really putting a lot of energy into recruiting really good people. And some people feel threatened when the people around them are smarter than they are. Other people feel that they're uh, strengthened by it. They're, they're enhanced by it. And I don't know, I always had a feeling, get me the best possible people. I'm not insecure about it. I am what I am and let them be smart as can be. And that's the way this will work best. And also, I, you know something, Hank, what I realized really when I was at Goldman Sachs still, is you get really terrific people around you and you give them credit for everything they've done, ultimately it redounds to your benefit. For sure. And now, now we're gonna talk about Treasury Secretary because you had a number of really notable really notable accomplishments, including successfully dealing with two financial crises and balancing the budget. So I'd like to start with the Mexican currency panic of 1995, you know, which, which you've already referred to. As I remember, you famously stopped it in its tracks, took some criticism to boot by using the, you know, the exchange stabilization fund. So talk about how that unfolded Explain what the Exchange Stabilization Fund is and how you used it in an unconventional manner. There are a lot of lessons in that Mexican situation, Hank, and I think it would make a good case study for a, a political science course or something of that sort. Mexico got in terrible trouble in 1994 and the currency started to collapse. Uh, the debt markets started to collapse. And it was pretty clear by the end of 94, early 95, that they were heading into a deep and, and massively extended crisis that would have terrible effects on us with respect to illegal immigration, drugs, uh, they were an export market for us and so forth. So Alan Greenspan, Larry, Tim Geithner, myself, others who you don't know, came together and we decided we should have a financial support package for Mexico that was contingent upon reform. And then we worked with the IMF to get a jointly provided package. But then we went to President Clinton and we said, Mr. President, this is what we want to do. 
it, it is, as I've already discussed, Hank, the question of probabilities, we think it'll work, but you've just lost terribly in the 94 midterms. And if we do this and it doesn't work, you'll pay a terrible political price. And this is one of the th lessons of Mexico. And that is you gotta be willing to make difficult decisions if you're gonna be effective in these jobs. He said, look, this is what we're elected to do, let's do it. He also understood that it was probabilistic. But the problem was that the leaders in Congress, the Democrat and Republican heads of the Senate and the House agreed with us, we needed to do this. They came to the White House. So the unusual situation, they all sat around. They agreed we should do it. Then they went back to their caucuses and they all backed away because it was so difficult. To his credit, Newt Gingrich is the one who stayed with us the longest. So then we had to use something. We had a discretionary fund called the Exchange Stabilization Fund. And we used it for this purpose, although it was a pretty, <laughs> it was a pretty liberal interpretation of what that thing was for. But anyway, we used it for this purpose. And yes, we were very severely criticized. Some people thought I should be impeached, one thing or another. But we did it and it worked. And eventually it saved Mexico and I think prevented a contagion that we were terribly troubled about with respect to emerging market countries around the world. And Bob, I'll tell you, during the 2008 financial crisis, the week after Lehman went down when AIG was rescued and there was a run on our money market funds and you know the money markets were funding commercial paper for industrial companies, you know, very big industrial companies that were going to fail if they couldn't or if they weren't if they weren't going to fail they weren't going to be able to pay their suppliers and so small companies would fail and it would have moved from wall street to main street and so what we did was we took a page from your book we used the exchange stabilization fund which was there you know to protect the dollar we got an expansive interpretation we had people that said how do you guarantee three and a half trillion dollars of money market funds with a 45 million dollar exchange stabilization fund but we did it and it worked. And it got a lot of criticism. And when Congress passed the Dodd-Frank legislation, as a matter of fact, when they, when, when they gave us the TARP legislation, they rescinded the ability to do that. They, they, they made it illegal to do what, what, what you had done and what we had done, but it had worked. And so it, it made a big difference. So I would now like to move on to some of the other things that you did. And one of the things that was, to me, very impressive was balancing the budget, because in a world of multi-trillion dollar fiscal deficits, our listeners might not remember that in 1997, the Clinton administration forged a compromise with the Republican Congress, Newt Gingrich, to balance the budget. What did it take to get this done? Why was this important? Look, it started in 93 when President Clinton did a deficit reduction package, which, as you will remember, passed by exactly one vote in the House. So it really, had it not passed, it would have probably been in a de facto sense uh, the end of his administration. But our view was that the underlying, the threshold issue in terms of an economic recovery in 93 was to move from what had been a projected, very threatening, at least in our view, fiscal trajectory to a sound fiscal trajectory. Then you came to 1997 and Trent Lott and President Clinton to their, to their great, in my opinion at least, their great credit, even though they had in other respects a very tense relationship, worked together and, and they compromised. Each, it was a give and take. I was in the Oval Office, Hank, at the very end and President Clinton was on the phone with Trent Lott and I had said to President Clinton beforehand, one thing Trent Lott wants is lower capital gains tax rates. That makes no sense. It will do us no good, in my opinion. That's the one, one of the very, one thing we could absolutely not do. And he said, I agree with you. I said, great. He got on the phone with Trent Lott. A few moments later, he turns to me and says, he wants a lower capital gains tax. I said, I know. We discussed that already. Put his hand over the, over the speaker, you know, so that Trent Lott couldn't hear him, the mouthpiece. And he said, I, yeah, I know that. And he got on the phone with Trent again. And he said, Trent, we'll lower capital gains taxes. And that was the end of that. But, but he was right. What he was saying was, I've got to give up some stuff I believe in, and he'll give up stuff he believes in, and we'll have something that both of us think is better substantively and better politically than where we are today. And that got us onto a balanced budget track. The tragedy of America today is that, this, that people are not willing to work with each other in that way. Yep. And you get ideologues that know they're right, they may be, but they're unwilling to compromise. And you don't get anything done unless it's done on a bipartisan basis with compromise. So I want to talk a bit about the huge structural deficit we have today. 
Should this be a concern to young people today and to some of us like you and me who aren't so young? <laughs> well, we're young. We, we may be young and in, in, uh, our, our intellectual views of this thing may be more sensible than some of those who are not concerned. I just got off the phone with somebody who you know and I know, Hank, who's a, you, both of us have a lot of respect for, who thinks we can go on like this for years and years and years and years because of the privileged position of the dollar with very low rates and, and tremendous deficit funding. And I, what I said to him was, you may be right, but you may be wrong. And markets have a way of getting out of sync with fundamentals and they stay out of sync sometimes for extended times until all of a sudden they don't. And when they don't, like happened in the Greek crisis, the Eurozone crisis, they can, they can come apart dramatically and harshly. And I think we're taking a lot of risk. So I think what we need to do I agree we need to do a, another stimulus. I, I do believe that, but you can debate that, but that's what I think. I think we need another large stimulus. But I think at the same time, we need a strategy that will repair our long-term fiscal trajectory because our long-term fiscal trajectory is forever steepening debt to GDP ratio. And I, I think that has all kinds of risks, interest rate risk, business confidence risk, resilience risk. It limits our ability to have the public investment we desperately need. And there's so many ways we could, the, the sad thing, Hank, to me is, we could do this. We're in a strong enough position to do this, not right now, but once we get back to somewhat better economic conditions, but there's very little political will around it. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I agree with you. I think that this can't last forever. So if we don't deal with our structural deficit, which comes about from a shortage of revenues, we, we need higher taxes and, and you know, we need to rein in spending. And the only way we can do that is fixing our healthcare policies and, and, and social security. So we're gonna have to do that. And I don't know when we'll hit the wall, but at some time the markets aren't going to accept it. And then we'll be in a situation where it'll be very hard to fix and we won't have a you know, global reserve currency anymore. I make one observation, you said something I think is really right, Hank. The United States spends about 18% of GDP on healthcare. The average OECD developed country spends about 10%. If we could just get our healthcare costs nationwide under control, that would save us money on Medicare and Medicaid. You wouldn't have to reduce the programs themselves, but you would reduce the cost curve in the programs. If we're spending 18% with no better outcomes and people are spending 10%, it is, I think, pretty apparent there's a lot one could do, but the politics of trying to fix healthcare seem not susceptible of effective response. Bob, I believe, I'm going to switch gears now. I believe that an important attribute of great leaders are a willingness to train others, to bring others, to bring the next generation along. And I believe that one of your greatest gifts to our country has been in identifying, mentoring, and advancing the careers of so many outstanding economic policymakers. People that come to mind to me are Larry Summers, Tim Geithner, Peter Orsag, Jason Furman, Michael Greenstone, Melissa Carney, Ben Harris, on and on. And you've done that through the Hamilton Project. Tell us about the Hamilton Project. Well, you know, I started out as you did, Hank, at Goldman Sachs. And we had a, we were talent centric. You know, you're part of the firm, the investment banking firm had a long history of recruiting the best and the brightest. And I think all of us sort of grew up with that attitude toward recruiting people and getting the best possible people you could around you. I'll tell you something interesting. When I was, at, at least I think it's interesting. When I was at Treasury, I had two chiefs of staff, first Sylvia Matthews Burwell, and then secondly, when she left to go to something in the White House, Michael Froman. Both of them became cabinet members under Obama. I mean, we just have been able to recruit terrific people. I've been very lucky. Goldman Sachs was a tremendous hotbed of terrific people. And the same thing was true of the administration that I was in. You know, you were extremely successful at recruiting terrific people. The Hamilton Project is an interesting thing. About 15 years ago, or thereabouts, Peter Orzag, who's now at Lazard, but became head of OMB and head of the CBO at various times. But this was before he became head of any of these things. Peter and I were testifying at a hearing against George W. Bush's Social Security reform. When we left it, I turned to Peter and I said, look, we spent all our time, we spent so much time opposing things. What would it cost us if we wanted to put together an affirmative agenda that reflects what we believe a country should be trying to achieve? And how would we do it and how would it be structured? And out of that came the Hamilton Project. And it's a very small group of people, but it's self-funded, it's self-governing, it's located at Brookings. And we have had tremendous traction. And I think the reason we've had tremendous traction 
is because we assemble the best thinkers around the country for five or six events a year on whatever the topic, you know, five or six separate events. And we are serious of purpose. We're not, we're not ideological, we're not partisan. We are all Democrats, pretty much. Not, well, actually not all, but pretty much all Democrats. But it, it is, when we have our events, we have a conservative, we have a progressive, we have all kinds, you know, try to get all points of view at our events. And there's been a tremendous appetite for that. And, and we, that's what we've done. And the people, you mentioned the people who are there, we have had, to, as executive directors, we've had this remarkable group of people that whose names you just mentioned. Yeah, and what I remember also, and know, you not only helped assemble them and mentor them, you proactively advanced their careers. I can remember when I was running Goldman Sachs after you'd left, and Tim Geithner came to the New York you know, Fed. And I met him for the first time. He, you know, he, he was young. He looked like he was about 12 years old, but he was, he was brilliant. And, and I heard, well, Bob Rubin had recommended him and advocated for him. And you called me and you called others and said, let me tell you, this guy is absolutely terrific. He be, went from being a civil service employee to be undersecretary or international for me, get to know him. And you're absolutely right. But so that to me, so you, you really advocated for people if they, if they did a good job. You know, the story on Tim is that Pete Peterson, who I was a wonderful man. Pete was chairman of the board of, it was, not the board, whatever it was called. He was chairman of the New York Fed and they needed to find a new president. He called me and I said, well, there's this fellow Tim Geithner. I think he'd be terrific. So he met Tim and he called me afterwards. He said, just what you just said, Hank. He said, look, I like him a lot, but this guy's 12 years old. We're not going to have a 12 year old president of the New York Fed. I said, Pete, spend some real time with him and see what you think. And Pete fell in love with him, just like Obama did later. Yeah, he, he sure did. Anybody that worked with him. So now I'm going to go to something even more fun to talk about. You and I share an addictive hobby, fly fishing. And we both enjoy spending time on saltwater flats, hours and hours, hoping to see and maybe even catch a bonefish or a tarpon. What is it about saltwater fly fishing that appeals to you? Well, I think when you do it, Hank, you, you're hoping to catch a fish, a, a tarpon or a bonefish. When I do it, I actually catch bonefish and tarpon. <laughs> I, I, have managed, I have managed to translate hoping into actuality. I, I love it, Here's Hank. the small fish. Mine are the big ones. But anyway, go on. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I'd like to hear some people validate that. Well, I don't want to hear your guides validate because God knows what, I don't know what you tip them. But, but. <laughs> I, 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 and you accuse me. You accuse me of using trick photography, right? Hold, holding the fish way out front. Way in front, and, and secondly, have, having the strangest ideas about metrics. But in any event, I love it, Hank. About thirty-five years ago, or a little bit over that, I was exhausted. I was at Goldman Sachs, of course, and I was just exhausted. And I said to my wife Judy, "Let's go away for a weekend, do something." So we went down to a place called. Uh, well, it's not. It's not open now. In any event, a, a bonefish club that somebody had recommended to us, and I'd never fished for bonefish before. Deepwater Key is the name of it, but I'd say it's not open anymore. And we went down there and I had a spinning rod in my hand and I cast for bonefish. And I saw somebody with a different kind of rod and I said to the guide, what is that? He said, it's called a fly rod. I said, can I try one of those? I got it in my hand and Hank, I've never fished with anything else since then. And I just love it. I love being on the water. I think, I think casting is, is an art form. And I think I'm actually reasonably good at it, in my opinion, at least. I love being on a, on a Montana stream and, and looking for the structure or the tailing fish or whatever it may be. And you know, it's hard to know exactly why one likes what one likes, but I just love it. You know, somebody said to me the other day that if you really are addicted to this thing, and I know you are, and, and so am I, it's sort of like meditation. You start and all of a sudden, six hours later, you realize the day is over. Yeah, it's beautiful. You're out there in the clear water, looking at all the sea life. And you know, it's, it's hard because you've got to see the fish, you've got to make the cast, make the cast, put the fly in front of the fish. So it's difficult. And so I find I'm concentrating, so it's relaxing. With me, it was similar too. I, I was down in the Florida Keys with a spinning rod. And this time I had a guide say, hey, have you tried a fly rod? I've got one in the boat. Now I done freshwater fly fishing and then, you know, I, I never put it down. So it's a, it, it's a great way to relax. You know what worries me though, Frank? And I think it's something, it's something you certainly have been involved with for a long time. I think we're destroying our habitat. I mean, we're damaging the oceans terribly. We're overdeveloping the West. We have this wonderful, the Western United States is so wonderful. And yet in so many places now, too much money has come in 
and it's, it's developing in ways, in my opinion, antithetical to the, the environment in which it's being developed. And the oceans are under terrible attack. And we have climate change, which is doing irreparable harm to all of us in all these ways. Yeah, I've spent a lot of time on the loss of biodiversity. And we're, we're in a huge biodiversity crisis. You know, we have a species extinction rate that's a thousand times greater than the historical average. And at this rate, where it used to be, you'd lose maybe five species, you know, a year. And it's just so much greater. And at this rate, we'll lose half the species on earth by 2050. You know, people have quantified, they've done a pretty good job of quantifying the risks of climate change. You and I both agree that we've underestimated those scientists have, yep. and the risks are much greater. Biodiversity, people haven't even begun to quantify what, what the impacts of that are, but I'm convinced they're huge, and, we, and, and I think they're things that really need to be done and can be done. And, and, but, aren't, and aren't the oceans being pooped? Oh, the, 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 oceans, the oceans are, you know, just, it's so sad what's happening to the ocean. And everything from, you know, the receptacles for trash to the overfishing, destroying all the fish stocks, and to the overheating of the oceans, to the coral reefs going, so th this is, and you're right, that the climate change and biodiversity loss go together. I mean, one accelerates the other, but there are things that can be done. There are important things that can be done, and it starts with protecting nature, and there you got to put a value on nature because people and policymakers often treat it as a, as a free good. And we've seen it in the Everglades. I mean, when the Everglades, you take a look at what it is you know, we subsidized sugar production so that they can dump their waste into the Everglades. It just is, is a crime. But I think you made a good point, Hank. Measurement is so important. And none of our metrics don't, GDP is a GDP, but it's not a green GDP. And you can, you can take, you can build a, I happen to know a little about the Everglades. You're right. I don't know a lot, but I know a little bit. You can develop these tremendous farms right adjacent to the Everglades, and it increases GDP if you measure it that way but there's no measurement of the immense damage it does to the, the natural environment. Yeah, and you know, I, one of the things that I've worked on recently and just come up with a big study that really places an economic value on nature, and it may not be perfect, but it's a good start and an important start. Now, Bob, to conclude here, what advice do you have for any young people who might be listening, and I hope are listening, and are beginning a career in the midst of this pandemic and wondering what the future might hold. What do you tell them? Well, you know, I, I taught a class recently with Larry Summers up at Harvard. And it's funny, he asked me the exact same question, Hank. First place, we have a lot of problems in this country, but having said that, I'd rather be involved in economic activity in this country than any other major economy in the world. I think we have great longer term strengths. We obviously have tremendously, or usually consequential policy challenges we have to meet. We've had a pretty dysfunctional political system. But I, I think for all kinds of reasons, I think the probabilities are that over time we'll, we'll meet our challenges reasonably well. That's all we need to do. So I, I would rather be involved in this country than any other place, recognizing that there are just enormous issues that markets will not deal with and our political system has to deal with and, and it has not been dealing with. So I totally agree with that, including the increasing inequality and climate change and lack of public investments our fiscal situation and so forth. So that's one. Two, as an individual, I think as I watch the young people at the firm that I'm part of now, I think what you need to do is you need to do whatever it is that you do with tremendous intensity and do it as best you possibly can. It's something you certainly always did, Hank, as, as best you possibly can. At the same time, I think you have to have some kind of a remove. You have to have a, sort of two simultaneous, well, this is my view, there's two simultaneous dy dynamics, if you will. One, tremendously intense involvement with what you're doing, and secondly, an ability to remove yourself some so you don't get consumed by the stress that it creates. And then for me, at least, I would do what I did when I was at Goldman Sachs. I was very lucky. I knew I wanted to be, once I got myself, my feet on the ground in my job, I wanted to get involved in the world, the world more broadly. I thought it would make my life more interesting and I could pursue things I cared about and so forth. And, and I found various ways to do that. And I've helped young people at our firm now do that. And I think it really adds a lot to your life. And the final thing I would say is be true to yourself. I just saw when I was in Washington, I'm sure I imagine you saw the same thing. So many people trying to figure out, there's more problem in Washington than the place I've been, trying to figure out, ah, 
I'm working with a senator, I'm working with the president, or I'm working with you know Secretary of Treasury, whatever the hell it may be, whatever it may be. What does he want? What does he what 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 should I say? What shouldn't I say? What does he want to hear? I think that's exactly the antithesis of what you should do. Try to understand issues yourself, understand them as best you can, be as substantive as you can, be diplomatic, be polite, but be true to yourself. And I think for the most part that works. I think President Clinton respected the people who were told him what they really felt, even when he disagreed with them. And I think he really didn't respect the people who were trying to figure out what he wanted to hear. Gus Levy, who was a senior partner of Goldman Sachs, you and I both worked with, Gus was, to say the least, a difficult man. I mean, my Lord, he, he managed by terror. But I worked pretty closely with him, as you know, because that's what I did at the firm. I was in that part of the business. I always told Gus what I really believed. And sometimes he'd throw me out of the office, but and, and quite, quite unceremoniously, actually. But but I think he respected me for it. And I couldn't have lived any other way. But I think yeah. pretty yourself. Yeah. He gave me some career advice, which was counter to what you and I agree with and what you just said, because I remember getting a call from him at home when I was, you know, showing some interest outside of the, the office. I, I was out gardening. And so my wife, Wendy, made the mistake of telling me I was gardening and it took me 10 minutes to get to the phone. I got to the phone and he congratulated me for what I'd done. And then he said, Hank, I'm going to give you some good advice. He said, you've got good prospects. You can be an outstanding investment banker. Spend time investment banking, forget about the gardening, and then you can hire a gardener and you'll never have to garden again. So, 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 so that was Gus Levy's advice. But Bob, this has been absolutely terrific. And I know you and I are both delighted that uh, we will have a president-elect Joe Biden and you know him well, you know so many people that will be working for him well. I am absolutely convinced that you're going to be giving them sound advice. And I'm just so grateful that uh, you'll be there and continue to provide advice to so many people that you've mentored over the years and to the new president. So thank you very much for being with us today. I, I enjoyed doing this. This was terrific. It's always nice to be with you. Good. So have a good day. You too. Peace. You have listened to Straight Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.